Kanikuman Muscle Grand Prix 2 is a tournament fighting game based on the Kanikuman series, which chronicles the clashes of wrestling champions with superhuman abilities. Muscle Grand Prix 2 was published by Banpresto and developed by Aki Corporation, now known as Sin Sophia. And Muscle Grand Prix 2 is the last entry in a short lived fighting game series that started back in March 2006 with the release of Kanikuman Muscle Grand Prix for Namco's System 246 arcade board. The System 246 board was the arcade equivalent of Sony's PlayStation 2 console, and as such, the series hot back and forth between the two with ports up to this final installment named Kanikuman Muscle Grand Prix Max 2 Tokumori. I'm just gonna call the last game Muscle Grand Prix 2 for the sake of simplicity. I find it interesting that the Kanikuman series has a game like this made so relatively recently. Generally, Kanikuman avoided the trend of Street Fighter 2 clones that saturated the 90s, aside from a few isolated incidents here and there. Many fighting games have paid homage to Kanikuman, either directly or through pop cultural osmosis, and I've been more obnoxious about pointing that out than most. But there are few fighting games based on the series itself. That's fitting though, it's a wrestling series, and there are many good traditional wrestling games based on the series including some made by Aki themselves back in the mid noughts In fact, Aki Corporation is still held in high regard for their work on various wrestling games from the 90s and early to mid 2000s, including the most venerated and most holy of wrestling games, WWF No Mercy. With this in mind, one might assume that switching gears from wrestling to one-on-one -on -one fighting would be a difficult task, but there's one easy method to make the switch that doctors hate. Step 1. Make a game within the confines of a genre you're very comfortable working in. In Aki's case, that's wrestling. Step 2. Change the camera angles and add some meters. And finally, step 3. Call it something else. In Muscle Grand Prix 2's case, a fighting game. Aki may not have invented the formula, but they put it to good use over the years when working for other developers and publishers. Such as when they worked on the first two entries in the Def Jam fighting game series, as well as when they worked on Sega's Black Panther Yakuza games. Worked for the Muscle Grand Prix series as well, but their wrestling format didn't blend too cleanly with the traditional side view that one-on-one -on -one fighting games tend to use. The camera could sometimes go off axis in a very disorienting way, especially in the first two games. That said, Aki's experience with cinematic camera angles in their traditional wrestling games is a huge boon to the Grand Prix series overall, for reasons I'll get into later. Another possible rough spot for the series is its roster. Because Kanikuman is a wrestling series, every game in the Muscle Grand Prix series is full of grapplers. Male grapplers at that, since Kanikuman Lady wasn't even a twinkle in Shuisha's eye at the time. Fighting games traditionally have varied archetypes in a single game, but every single character in MGP2 is a grappler first, and occasionally some second thing afterwards. So this guy? Grappler. This dude? Grappler. These guys? Grapplers. All grapplers. This isn't necessarily a bad thing though. One of the reasons I like Muscle Grand Prix 2 so much is because it satisfies a thought experiment I've been chewing on for years. What if you had a game that was basically filled with only one type of character? For years, Muscle Grand Prix 2 has stood as an example of such a thing being done well, which is important for me to note because recent games have shown how awful something like that can be when it's done without any regards to cohesiveness. It's probably god awful for people who hate grapplers, but those people can cry about it all they want because they're babies. Muscle Grand Prix didn't have to be this way, mind. There's a long history of taking anime characters and cramming them into character archetypes to check boxes off a list, and Banpresto could have totally gone for that. But they let Aki do their thing, and the game has a very robust set of mechanics because of this grappler heavy focus. To show you what I'm talking about, as always, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the basic mechanics of the game. Now, movement works as a mixture of 2D and 3D, which was the style at the time. Characters face each other by default and move forwards or backwards in reference to one another, but they can also sidestep into the foreground or background with little hops. It all feels very heavy and weighty. Every motion is animated to give the impression that there's a lot of weight being shifted around on the canvas. 
Walking forwards and backwards will move characters on a set axis, but sidestepping shifts that axis. Running will stick to that axis no matter what, and some moves will fling you or your opponents all over the place. Strikes, or normal attacks, are handled with one button. That's the wrestling heritage taking shape. Each fighter has a set of individual attacks using traditional inputs, such as tapping opposite directions, quarter circle forwards, half circle forwards, half circle back, that sort of thing, as well as chains that use multiple button presses in combinations of directional and button inputs. Most characters have oddly unique chains, even if the main difference is that it adds or takes away directional pressures here and there, so there's not a lot of overlap. But almost everyone has a two-hit chain that only requires two presses of the attack button, and there's a generous buffering window. The game always lets you input one full motion before the last one is finished. Also, there are three types of hit stun that normal attacks can inflict. Most normal attacks can't stun opponents long enough to guarantee a combo, despite what the combo counter says. However, some attacks can cause light stun, which is usually enough to tack on another attack and some attacks cause heavy stun, which leaves opponents stunned for a few seconds. And many strikes can be cancelled with other types of attacks, such as grabs. Most grabs are mapped to the grab button. Again, that's the wrestling at work. Every character has a handful, and they all look great, but more importantly, they're all effective. Grabs inflict damage, change positioning relative to the wrestling on the ring, and put the player being tossed around at a disadvantage. You can even Irish whip your opponent with back and grab, or switch sides by double tapping back and pressing grab, and even grab someone as soon as you're able to get off the ground. All grabs, including wake up grabs, are context sensitive, and some of the more technical characters have special grabs that have unique effects or follow ups based on the opponent's position in the ring. But everyone has a grab for tossing running opponents around, which is an easy follow up to an Irish whip. And it's also worth noting that any attack gets bumped up a tier when it lands on an opponent running off the ropes. Normal attacks cause light stun, light stun attacks cause heavy stun, and etc etc. All the signature moves are mapped to the special button. The flashy grabs, the stunning strikes, almost anything that's worth meter is attached to this button. The strongest special moves, called ultimates, are performed with either strike in special or grab in special. They're essentially super moves, and they usually reference specific moments or signature techniques, so naturally, they're also some of the most powerful or useful moves in the game. A fun thing to note is that ultimates use 9 bars of meter, but the spirit meter just barely counts as 10, so after an ultimate has been used, you have almost enough for one bar left over, but not quite. The special buttons also use to charge the spirit meter. By pressing forward, back, and special, players can power up their meters. This charging animation can also be used to cancel normal attacks, and furthermore, the recovery from it is nearly instant, so it can be used to make moves safe, squeeze extra attacks into a combo, or do other nutty things. Players can use the guard button to block striking attacks. This game has an unorthodox block system because the height of the moves used is irrelevant. There are no lows, highs, or mids. If it hits, it hits, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. However, a move that would normally stun on hit will cause a character to stumble backwards on block, and if they stumble backwards into the ropes, they're vulnerable to attack. Strikes can be parried by pressing forward and guard, but both blocking and parrying are vulnerable to grabs, and a mistimed parry attempt leaves characters open for a split second. Throws can be broken with back and guard, but they lose to strikes, and they also leave characters open to attack, and pressing guard while falling performs a rolling recovery. There's a power level gimmick in the Kinikamon series that roughly translates to Burning Inner Strength, and it's abbreviated in-game as KKD. It's performed by pressing attack, throw, and guard at the same time. Activating it triggers a burst of power that also leaves players invulnerable. The stage and everything other than the UI and character models are blacked out for a time, which indicates how long the invincibility frames last. After activating KKD, characters also gain special boosts, based on the spirit that was selected before the start of the match. Spirits are sort of like grooves, since they give different perks when characters are at low health. They're all color-coded, and since I only butchered the absolute minimum of Japanese necessary for a video, I'll just stick to the colors. Blue boosts attack power, 
red doubles the amount of spirit gained during any action, and green increases your defense. When KKD is activated, blue allows you to string strikes together without recovery frames, red allows you to use special moves without recovery frames, and green strengthens the body, increasing resistance to stun by one level against all attacks and speeding up recovery on wake up. Muscle Grand Prix 2 is rougher around the edges where it relies on traditional fighting game conventions. For example, the basic buttons and movement are functional, but they're also very stiff and weighty, like most of Aki's other games. To compensate for this, Aki made all their chains and special cancelable moves bufferable, but they had to put the buffer window at the start of each chain to make it sync up with the animations, and that actually tightens the cancel window even further. Muscle Grand Prix 2 is much more well-rounded at its core, where it focuses on things that most other fighting games wouldn't. For example, most games with this mix of 2D and 3D would compensate for the limbs by making all of the hitboxes distended to make combos more consistent. But Aki kept the hitboxes in Muscle Grand Prix 2 close to the character models. It makes combos incredibly wonky and spacing dependent, but it makes parrying and blocking much more consistent, because players don't have to worry about magic pixels on striking attacks catching them from two character widths away. And yet, they did stretch the hitboxes for throws and ultimate attacks, because they expect people to use those to beat out other types of moves, and that's how it actually works in practice. Knockdowns are another good example of what I'm talking about. The game has three kinds. Soft and hard knockdowns work the way you might expect. It's easier to hit someone during a hard knockdown because they're flat on their back and struggling to get up. But neither one has a set amount of recovery. There's always a little bit of variation, a little risk. The third kind is a spinning knockdown, and that's the most reliable one. You can keep hitting a character until he hits the ground, and after his back touches the mat, he stays down for a fixed amount of time. Not every character can force a spin knockdown to happen, but the ones that can usually have something that can hit others at that angle. And every knockdown resets damage scaling, so those characters can get raw damage off of that spinning knockdown. So it's not that Aki's ignorant of how fighting games work, or that they forgot everything they learned on the other games. They just went a different way with it, that's all. There are other things I really like about Muscle Grand Prix 2 as well like the way Aki swapped models around for special moves mid-match, which gives the game a bit of flash, and allows Aki to take full advantage of the weird moves that the series offers. It's a very convincing way of translating 2D animation into 3D animation. I wish more developers would tear themselves away from soaking their games in particle effects for a few years to try and do more stuff like this. As I mentioned before, the game camera can be disorienting when sidestepping, but almost everything else it does is very dramatic, and gives even the most basic moves a lot of gravitas. That's the game's wrestling foundation working for it rather than against it. The ultimate moves benefit the most from these camera angles. You don't know the meaning of the term cinematic super until you've seen some of the more convoluted ultimate moves. And it's admirable how both games in the NGP series portrayed these moves, since they were ahead of the curve of that trend, and almost had the perfect ratio of animation to damage output nailed down years before it was even an issue in more mainstream fighting games. What I personally love about Muscle Grand Prix 2 is how well combination throws work. It's got one of the best combination throw systems because it has one of the most lenient throw systems. If you've played another fighting series that's featured combination throws or toyed with the idea of them, you know that they're almost always difficult, and sometimes they're difficult for difficulty's sake. And if you don't know, now you know. In some cases, it's a justified restriction on an otherwise overpowering set of techniques, using an execution barrier as a serious risk. However, most cases are just obnoxiously obtuse, with the KOF series being a top offender. Look at how you go on, Clark Steele. Look at these inputs. It's horrific. Tekken gets a pass because it allows players to prep for inputs by holding buttons, but it's one of the few series that does such a thing. Muscle Grand Prix 2 doesn't mess around like that. It's so generous with its buffer windows during combination throws that you can even mash the inputs in if you want. That's not to say that they're perfect. Some are just there for the sake of accuracy. And since most of them are generally 5 bars, they lack the cost efficiency of a special throw or the big damage of an ultimate move and stand in an awkward middle ground between the two. 
but even so, they have their uses. Some have alternate effects, and most at least offer superior positioning at the end of them. And they don't overcomplicate things. The stuff you can do with the ring also made a really big impression on me. I've talked at length about how much I like Slam Masters 2 before, which sits in the same niche as MGP2 as a wrestling-themed fighting game, and MGP2 handles ring work in a similar way. As I mentioned before, you can throw wrestlers into the ropes for an Irish whip. Some characters also have special throws that use the ropes or turnbuckles against the opponent. These special throws often have a secondary effect. They usually drain the opponent's spirit meter by one or two levels. The only strange thing is that the ring works on a grid system. So, for example, if you get knocked back into the turnbuckle, but then someone uses an attack that would push you backwards or Irish whip you into the turnbuckle, you get pressed into a set of ropes instead. It's very strange that you can't get knocked into the turnbuckle itself, but uh, I suppose that's Aki's way of maintaining the idea of corner pressure in a 3D ring. Muscle Grand Prix 2 is a peculiar game, but it is truly unique, and after years of playing it on and off, I feel confident in saying that it's a good game, even if it is janky. Aki cracked open the traditional fighting game setup a bit and shaped Muscle Grand Prix 2 to their liking, and the result is worth checking out. Personally, I'm just relieved that I can finally finish this episode, because I've been making it for three years now, in between getting sick, uh, getting confused, doubting whether or not this game makes any sense, and being blown out by the Super Best Friends WrestleMania special. But in the end, I stuck with it, and I'm glad I did. Thanks for watching, and happy Kanikaman Day.